writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the Right Pack. Welcome back to Right Pack Radio. This is your host, David Allen Lucas, author of various things and now working on audio dramas. And with me today is my lovely co-host, Kathleen Kayembe, paranormal romance author under the pen name Kaseka and Vita. Lee Savage, erotic author and under the pen name Carrie Lee Williams, children's book author. I'm Fedora Amos. I write Victorian whodunits like Jack the Ripper in St. Louis and my recently released Mayhem at Buffalo Bill's Wild West. If you happen to be in the Washington, D.C. area at the end of April, the very last weekend in April, which moves over into May, come by and see me at the Hyatt Hotel where we're doing Malice Domestic for lovers of traditional mysteries. I'm going to be there. I'd love to see you. Also, yes. too, in May, you've got... In May? Don't you oh, yes. That? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in May, May 21st, I'll be in St. Charles at Main Street Books along with Lynn Cahoon, and we'll be talking up mysteries and selling some of our wonderful new books. She has a new one out, which is called Teacups and Something or Other, which I can't remember the other name at the moment. But at any rate, we'll be there, and we'll be entertaining, I promise you. <laughs> My name is Jennifer Stolzer. I'm a children's book author and illustrator, and this is a little bit removed because this weekend, the weekend of recording was St. Louis Comic Con, in which I made a very special announcement. I give my announcement to all of you here. My uh, my fantasy novel, Threadcaster, is going to be self-published this time next year. Woohoo! I'm passing out promo cards. Everybody <laughs> go to threadcaster.com, and you can watch through the year 2016 uh, watch how I do it and the steps I take to do it, and join me on the on the path. Congratulations! Yeah. So great, yeah. great for you know, maybe every week we should ask for an update. An update? No, that'll keep me honest. <laughs> yes. so, have you done anything? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I got I got how many months? <laughs> yes. I. Uh, I can appreciate your where you're coming from. I have uh, something labeled Fantasy Novel 2014, and guess what? I didn't finish the first draft yet. <laughs> um, I'm Melanie Quaney, and I am apparently a very slow author, and uh, currently I am working on trying to fix my plot. So, so this is perfect. Yeah, this will do perfect well. day. Yeah. So today, <laughs> so today our topic for Right Back Radio is going to be how to fix a manu messy manuscript and keep the promise to the reader. So, I just finished, which I wish I, this is true in real life, I had just finished this great first draft. I think this is really good. How should I go about editing it or really believing that it's good? And You should immediately it? send it to every agent you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! <laughs> That's a good way to get blacklisted. <laughs> yeah, save, save it immediately out of your NaNoWriMo draft and send it straight to all the top yeah. agents and uh, that'll definitely give you success every single time. Preferably on uh, December 1st. On December 1st in a, in a document format that hasn't been double space. <laughs> hey, audience, in case you don't realize this, Jennifer's being extremely sarcastic. Extremely. I love her to death, but yeah. In fact, you just got. And she's finish. got the most innocent smile going on. Why is she saying it? <laughs> Everything you just heard her say, do not do. Yes. It was a. They know she was being sarcastic. Please tell me you know she was being sarcastic. <laughs> if you've listened to any other episodes of the yes. show, you know. Right. Mm -hmm. And you just got done um, at Comic-Con talking about stuff I like did, this. I did, yes. I was speaking at Comic-Con about writing and writing process. And uh, we didn't touch too much on on fixing manuscripts. There were four people on the panel, so we were mostly talking about our own process and right. what kept our inspiration going and how we all worked and... We, we specifically uh, highlighted the different kinds of publishing you could take. Uh, I mentioned Right Pack Radio because we're a font of information. <laughs> so it's all, it, it was an interesting talk. It was interesting as always to hear other people and what their processes were. The general consensus was uh, give it to somebody who will give you feedback on it. Uh, don't assume that your first draft is the best draft 
And if you run into a wall, switch mediums for a while. Yeah. Are there any common problems that you guys find in manuscripts, whether your own or someone else's, that like, are there basic arenas like bone problems versus muscle versus skin <laughs> problems, like some that are rashes and some that are gaping wounds? What are the big problems? First off, did I just enter my genre of horror and mystery with that one? <laughs> um, you know, gaping wounds. Well, you know, I feel like in some ways you're going in like a doctor. You have to evaluate the problem and potentially do, you know, surgery. surgery. Which is the very reason why you need to get some distance from it in the first place. Uh And you get distance in more ways than one. One is simply to put it away for two weeks, a month, a year, however long it takes for you to forget most of what is there. Another way is, of course, to get other pairs of eyes on it. So it depends on how much time you have, how quickly you forget, and how many people that actually know something about creating structure and using words in a manuscript, how many people like that you know. Uh, Talking about genres of problems that you run into, obviously you have plot issues, Mm -hmm. pacing issues, one of my favorite ones to look for is uh, is character issues, specifically character motivation. Something I run into a lot. That I think I've mentioned in the past, uh, specifically with creators like George Lucas, who accidentally, I don't think he does it on purpose, accidentally likes to write his characters swapping roles for no reason I can conceive of. Uh, he write in, in the prequels, the Star Wars prequels, there are a couple uh, instances in which um, the young learning Jedi who hasn't been on the job as long uh, sits back and is the rational one while the old master is the one who throws himself out a window for no good reason. (laughs) And technically, if you were looking at it, if he was asking me to be his editor, I would say, shouldn't that be the other way around? Shouldn't the young impulsive one throw himself out the window when he doesn't know if there's anything to land on? And then the learned peace loving one will go get the car that seems like something they would do. Uh, Similarly, later on in, in and in the same movie, because I'm talking about uh, Attack of the Clones, mm-hmm. uh, the in the romance plot, Anakin is the one who is begging for a relationship, and Padme is the one who's saying she can't do it because of her position, when he's the Jedi who's not allowed to love, and she's a politician, so right. technically she should have five boyfriends by now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Five boyfriends and six waiting. Yeah, so that's that's a problem when you and I've had that happen to me before as well. You know, I mentioned Threadcast earlier in this recording. I had one scene that just wasn't working for me, and I realized that Cat and Peter were behaving opposite from what they needed to be. Uh, so I switched their dialogue tags, and all of a sudden the scene worked so much better with just a little bit more tailoring. It, it went along. I had one fighting so hard to get their point across, and I realized they didn't believe in their point. The other person would believe in the point more. The point being, we should charge into the middle of everything and call attention to ourselves. And for whatever reason, the character who was the most self-conscious was fighting for this. It didn't make any sense. When I backed away from it, I said, why is he saying that? That doesn't make any sense at all. So I gave him the one where he said, no, let's not do it. And suddenly the scene was better. That reminded me of Batman v Superman. <laughs> saying Dawn that very, justice. You, you honored the way that J.J. Abrams likes to refer to his film. Yes. No, incorrect. that's wrong. Zack Snyder likes to refer to his, his film. Yes. No no hate to Abrams. He didn't do that. No. Abrams is good. Um, <laughs> I saw Batman v Superman the other week. I am glad I saw it for a discounted price because it was not worth money. <laughs> I was very upset by it. It was a decent movie, but what I found problematic were problems, the, the main issues like plot, uh, characterization, and the promise is that their source material, the source characters, the canon Batman, canon Superman from DC Comics, the promises that those characters um, have in whatever they are due to, their, due to their characterization versus the film characterization and the, uh, the marked difference between the source material and what they were presenting in the films. So you say it's an adaptation problem? Yes. So um, my example is Batman. In DC Comics and all the um, cartoons that I adore that have Batman as a character, he is the world's greatest detective. Where other heroes will go off blindly into a situation, Batman has a plan, he has a backup plan, he has he's chess moves, he's multiple moves ahead of everyone, and nothing breaks his calm. Hmm. He knows who he is, he knows why he is Batman, 
And he's kind of made peace with the fact that Bruce Wayne is a mask and Batman is who he is. Mm -hmm. In the film that I just saw, Batman was led around by the ears, basically, by Lex Luthor and did not realize that he was being manipulated. (laughs) And he was... Is this angry? a spoiler? Yes, yeah, spoiler alert. <laughs> he was angry. He, His issues with his parents were unresolved. And little things set him off in ways that the Batman that I knew from DC Comics would never have been. So characterization was a big problem I had with that film. I feel like they needed to go back to the drawing board. The other thing is that when I'm watching something with Batman, the promise that DC Comics gives me is I'm going to see the world's greatest detective in action. And what I saw was an idiot. (laughs) So I felt in that way the film broke promises to me that in the very name of what it was should have been fulfilled. In in defense of films, we haven't seen Batman as the world's greatest detective in a while now. His movie persona is a lot more kicking people in the face and a lot less finding clues. Well, the thing, though, is he has to be intelligent. And he was shown as intelligent in other points in the movie. But there were some basic things... <laughs> You know, he was very easily to manipulate. Let's yes. put it that way. I, I like the movie much more than you. Let me just put that in there. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> I will say to Jen's comment, The Dark Knight, it shows him being a detective. Mm-hmm. I think that's the only one of the three, mm-hmm. but Dark Knight did show him being a detective. However, I want, I'm glad in a way, even though you and I will disagree about Batman versus Superman in the sense of it being a as terrible as you've just pointed mm-hmm. out. We'll talk more after the episode. She, if yeah. I have She's time. got a lot of I feelings do have, right I do now. have it. I do. I, I do have my issues with it. Number one is I think they try. I think DC tried to make up, tried to make up too much ground on Marvel by throwing everything into this yes, one movie. Yes, that was another problem I had with it. And it, they should have done it. But so is there a pacing issue in that? Yes, mm-hmm. the big pacing issue. Oh, it was and so forth. Plot. But I'm, but I was you gonna say, finish. which you've raised here, Jen just raised point number two. I want to go to. Oh, okay. Which you raised about the promises, whatever we write. Whatever we see on television, whatever movies we go to, whatever audio plays you might listen to, nope, if you listen to audio plays, <laughs> uh, is you, you walk in, you write in a genre or multi-genre field, and there are promises you have to keep to your audience. If you're doing an adaption like Batman versus Superman was an adaption. You have the promise that the, that the DC universe has, and that's what you're walking in and expecting to see a DC style film. You walk into a Marvel film, you're expecting a Marvel style film. You walk into a mystery, you're expecting su- a mystery there. You're not walking into a mystery and suddenly seeing Conan the Barbarian running around wearing almost nothing and a sword. You don't walk so into a DC. It's funny you mentioned Conan the Barbarian, given that he's a character that you see in Batman versus Superman. But go on. <laughs> so I said in a mystery. You don't walk into DC and expect to see My Little Ponies. Okay. <laughs> I think I just gave Kathleen, Kathleen an idea wishes that she'd seen Oh my, my gosh, I want to see a Batman My Little Pony so badly right now. DeviantArt, you'll find it in three seconds. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, what have you done, Dave? <laughs> that made me very I have happy. created a monster yet again. I, I do this well. All right, so oh, okay. you were going to so, bring up pacing. I was going to bring up pacing. And pacing is another thing. Pacing is... I find pacing hard for myself because... I really wish I had studied music more as a kid than I did. Because hmm. I find there's a certain amount of, well, I want to say tempo that goes with pacing. So how do you guys... With, okay, let's first off identify. When, we, when you have a novel or a script or whatever done, number one, what Fedora said, put it, put it away long enough that you can come back to it with a John Desai. Uh, mm-hmm. John Desai. Um, John Desai. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know if that's what you. Uh, no, John, John Desai meant. That is with, with a degree of fairness mm-hmm. and detachment. And more impartial. Okay. impartial. Oh, I've always heard it called John Desai. Okay. So, so John, that, that just tells me you're coming back yellow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So before that's the way I always heard. So you want to have uh, some distance from the main. You want to have some distance. So now that you've got your novel back out of a dusty ro- drawer, or you found your uh, flash drive mm-hmm. underneath the couch, mm-hmm. and now you push, pushed it back in. What are you going to look for next? Are you going to look for pacing first? Are you going to look for characterization, tone? What do you look for now? 
Well, what I tend to do is after I've had enough time that I can look at it with fresh eyes, like I'm a new reader as much as I can be, um, I'll read through all of it and mm -hmm. make comments either on the computer or by hand as I go through and just look for bigger things. Um, I look for the, the the bone problems, not the, oh, there's a rash on this arm. Okay, so, so what's the bone pro Give me so an example like, of bone. Uh, things that Jennifer mentioned earlier, like plot, pacing, characterization, and structure. Like, do some things happen earlier than I need them to, and do some things happen later than they should? Um, so things like line edits, things like language, which I will edit for, um, and rhythm, um, I will save those for later, because those are things that will definitely be changed if I change how the plot works, how the pacing is, if I rearrange um, structural issues with the story. So I save the things that will be directly affected by any big changes I make for later. And I just comment on the big changes and things like, this character would not do this here, you know, things like that. And then I'll go back through and look at all the notes that I made and figure out what the solutions to those problems that I've raised are. Yeah, I'm a plotter, but that doesn't mean I don't change things as I go along. And I was reading back through what I already wrote and I made a promise to myself not to edit till I got a draft done. And I was reading, it's like, oh boy, uh, hmm, that doesn't, that can't happen. That doesn't make any sense anymore, you know? I think there are a lot of times in plot that one thing will run up against another. That is your desire to have an exciting scene. This is a mystery and thrillers ex especially that you want an exciting scene. You want it to be uh, life threatening to your hero or heroine. But at the same time, you have to keep your heroine or your hero be believable and likable. And oftentimes, especially in femjeps, that's uh, for anybody who doesn't know, women in jeopardy. Femjeps. <laughs> yes, it's an actual genre, <laughs> some genre of mystery. Yep. It's women in jeopardy. Like it's the Trump genre. It is. <laughs> yeah, good, yes. yes. That often. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a super villain femjeps <laughs> someday. In, <laughs> only in order men. to have this this really harrowing scene. You have to make your heroine be stupid, T-S-T-L, too stupid to live. As in, whoa, she went down into a cellar where there might be a hidden killer and her phone was dead. I mean, how stupid can you get? All alone she did this. And of course that's going to make for a greater uh, thriller but it's going to make your heroine so stupid that no one is going to care about her anymore. So you have to be very careful to tread a lot of these lines and not make your heroine or hero stupid just in order to have a really flashy climax. I think that is a, a key problem for anybody in mystery and probably in romance too, don't you think? Mm -hmm. I was just thinking Hercules, he's the stupid hero. You know, but he can punch his way out of stupidity. Yeah. <laughs> but that's why he also runs into um, labor, so much his strength is not always going to be the solution. Some, oh, uh, so I have a novel that is going to be finished by the time I leave for Clarion. It is a rule. Hmm. Um, but uh, it's been such a long time since I started writing it that when I read back through it to continue writing the draft, because I'm not going to restart it. I know mm -hmm. if I restart it, nothing will get done because I will be so depressed. Um, hmm. But having reread it and talked to uh, my plot doctor, who is sitting across the table from me, Miss Jen Stolzer, Hi. Um, I realized with her help that the beginning needs to be rewritten, and I'm a chronological writer. So there are things in the beginning that are going to change that are then going to have repercussions throughout the rest of the draft that I'm currently writing. So I've made notes to that effect, but I'm going to leave it for now. I think one of the things you have to do when you're going through a manuscript is pick your battles. There are some you need to be strategic. What needs to be fought first? What needs to be worked out first? And then see where that leaves you and then pick your next biggest issue and go from there. I do have a question. I'm going to go ahead and let you two go first and then I'm going to come back with Okay. Um, I just recently um, had Angel of Death re-edited and come to find out a couple of my side characters were dropped. I, n I never explained what happened to them <laughs> because I got so wrapped up in the main plot that I left out a couple little minor plots, which was with it being, you know, so long since I had originally written it, and the editor had fresh eyes, and she was like, here you go, and I was able to fix it. And then the other thing that um, 
coming back since I've learned from the beginning is I'm a head hopper. I'm a bad head hopper. Mm -hmm. And I was... Would you uh, define the term? Head hopper is like people that write in um, where it moves from person to person, just like if I was talking and you were talking. I switch viewpoints, like like, just like we were around the table all switching viewpoints. Mm -hmm. But in a book, it doesn't work that well if you switch viewpoints that quickly. Mm -hmm. So what I have to do to write is I have to write it how I feel it and see it, and then I have to go back and edit it later and try to put all of his viewpoint here and then switch to her viewpoint and back and forth because I ran into a pro with a love scene that I could not write that way because it didn't feel natural to me unless it was going back and forth naturally. So if you can learn certain points, then it makes it easier to go back later on and edit yourself because you know to look for these problems that you do. Yeah, that's a really good point. If you know how you work and how you usually function as a writer and what your big issues are, you can plan for them. Mm-hmm. Well, we're, the whole talk is about pacing and how you address pacing and pacing problems. Part, that was yeah. the prompt of, uh, of this roundtable bit. I just wanted to make a note that we're all talking about going back and editing after a first draft. It's almost impossible to fix your pacing in the middle of your story. That's true. Mm-hmm. So just, just a note to all the writers out there. If you're concerned about pacing issues, you won't be able to see it unless you can see you finish the, the first draft and you can see the whole thing laid out. And that's when all the pieces of your puzzle become sliding. You can slide it left and right to make... Uh, more time before this happens to raise suspense or less time because it was dragging. Uh, you can't really gauge that until you know how fast the rest of the novel is moving. So. Which is the real, I believe, the real reason why people say don't edit until you're done. Um, related to pacing, that's something that I didn't really realize that I do, but that's one of the reasons I think that I make comments but don't stop too long in any one section. I try to read the story, the draft, straight through so that I know how it all feels, like whether it's going too slow in places or too fast. But I did want to bring up um, Keeping Plot Threads Under Control is an Mm -hmm. episode we did recently. So if you want more information about how to balance plot threads and pick things up that you might have dropped, uh, go see that. Go listen to that episode. I have a question for everybody, and I'm going to go around the table. Um, I'll let Melanie or Kathleen choose to be first. It's not a, nothing I'm putting you guys on, on, the front, on the front street with. I like blue, but silver too. What? Go on. Okay. <laughs> so I just gave her a look like, huh? Anyway, really quick, my question to you is, what is your preference when it comes to editing? Do you prefer to have it printed out? Or do you have, prefer to edit on your computer? Um, I will say, in general, I prefer to have it on the computer because there's this little thing called track changes. And uh, especially when I'm not all that, I can, I tend to want to like, oh yeah, this whole paragraph needs to move here, cut out this, go around that. And it is just, the whole cut and paste function is wonderful in comments. And, you know, I know what either I'm talking about when I go back later to fix it, or if I'm giving it to someone else, they can more understand it and make the changes that they want. I prefer to have a printout because, um, like Kathleen said, there's a big difference between bone problems and skin problems. And my issue when I'm working on the computer is that I'm tempted to start just word swapping. You know, oh, it sounds better if I put it this way. Oh, I could rephrase that like this. And I completely lose sight of the fact that I was looking to make sure he stayed in character the whole time instead of rewriting his dialogue to be probably about the same amount of good, just different. I have a lot of word swapping issues. So I like to print it out. I like to, uh, to get a printout from a place like Lulu that'll do it mm. for cheap a cheap bound copy of my book, uh, as opposed to going to Office Max and printing it off for 60 or $70. I, I'm not made of money over here. <laughs> so get a printout like that, go at it with a red pen, and then use the track changes and copy-paste functions in my digital draft to apply the edits that I saw when I was reading it, and keep track of it that way. I don't like transcribing. <laughs> <laughs> as for me, computer, definitely. When I am finished, I will have... Uh, only one copy. It will have been edited many, many times all along the way. And I will have printed out uh, something and that I will be sharing with my critique partner. And so I have that printed copy, which has a lot of marks and this and that on it. And then I'll have the finished one, which is the most recent, the most everything. 
and it may get more changes, but uh, it will be complete. Fedora, you are depriving your biographers of valuable source <laughs> material here. <laughs> Uh, mostly computer. Um, I also like the tracking feature. Um, my new editor that I have, um, we use that so that way she can track and then I can go back and see and then I can make changes and then she can see what I changed as well as if I give it to um, anyone else, um, um, say um, peer readers or anything like that, I can see any of their suggestions. And I found I also, when people give me stuff, I prefer using that to critique their stuff because then they can just say, no, I don't want to accept that, and it, it goes back to their normal, or they can say accept it, and it's just really easy to go back and forth. I'm a hybrid. Um, for critiquing other people's work, for people critiquing my work, I prefer computer. Track changes and comments are amazing. But I have just realized that I have a pattern for longer stories, for novellas, for novels. If it's the first draft that I'm editing, I want a paper copy. Um, I think as with, as with what Jen said, it helps not to uh, start word swapping because I can get distracted. Mm -hmm. And so for longer stories, I like to have a paper draft. It also gives me a feel for how long it is and the, the whole page turning thing and a better idea of pacing. Um, for short stories, though, if it's a first draft, I can do it on the laptop just fine, and it doesn't matter as much because it's shorter, so the pacing is still something I get a feel for on the computer. And again, it lets me make comments and it makes me, lets me make certain changes, but I don't have to keep them. So I'll do track changes on a final draft looking uh, thing so I don't see the changes that I made, and I can go through it and read it and see how it is, but then it still says, you know, there's a change here, so I can decide if I like it better one way or the other. I'm closer to Jen in the sense, at least especially the first draft. No, <laughs> no, actually multiple drafts I do this. Eventually I get to the point where you are, Kathleen, where I keep it on the computer and send it off and keep your track changes and so forth that way. But like Jen, I'll get printed off, but I won't print it up in the book. I've not done that yet. Doesn't mean I won't. I sit down and I will sit down with a box of colored pencils and I will go through the draft with, say, the green pencil. Mm -hmm. All the way through. Put it aside, come back to it again in a couple days. I'll go through it with the red pencil. And what I'm doing is I'm, I know, for example, the, the first short story I had published, <coughs> which came out of a vampire novel, which I haven't put out there to be published. Um, basically, I went through 727 drafts doing that. Just one printed draft, 27 colors, going through and re-looking, because like it was almost like an online track changes, but it was on paper. And I could note, mark, and I was not tempted to change anything until what I was done. What were all the colors for? Yeah, that's my question. Well, yeah. the, the colors became, I went through first looking for plot, for tone, pacing, and then I was going through character voices. Did I make, let's say for example, if I meet the people here at the table, my characters, I did not want Jen and Melanie to sound alike. But if I found that they were, that meant I was talking, not <laughs> Jen, not Melanie, not Fedora, no one here at the table. So I was going through it, and then I was reworking, like you point out, you're, you are a chronological writer, Kathleen. Mm -hmm. I am too. And I'll be going through like, okay, I just changed this. What does that do? I just changed something in Chapter 3. What does that do to Chapter 20? Mm -hmm. And then so forth. And I was finding that in, I find that with characters, and I went, I am a pantser. I've gone back to it. I've admitted I can't do plotting. Even though my genre should demand I do plotting, I get bored. So I pants it. I go through the actual investigation as I'm writing it. Well, now Timmy, who was in the story, has suddenly dropped off the face of the earth <laughs> as, as Lee has done. It's like, well, okay, did, did what happened to Timmy? And by the way, can I make that more important? Can Timmy have suddenly been put in front of an oncoming bus and made that part of the murder mystery? You know, I, that's basically what the colors were for. And it did have colors specifically. So, specifically, so in other words, Kathleen, you have been red. You're wearing red, so I'm choosing red. I would have had Fedora be black because that is the color she's wearing. <laughs> um, Melanie Blue, I would have done Lee's dialogue in green and 
Jen's dialogue in purple and gone through. And that way I can also just visually see where are they talking, how often am I giving those characters time in the story? Do they, and am I giving time to a character that does not deserve that much? I find it interesting that you listed big problems in the order that you did before going down to the, the other edits mm -hmm. with your pencils. Because mm -hmm. you said 27 different colors, so I'm guessing there's a lot of characters and a lot of other things. There can be. But uh, you listed the big problems first. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I think plot was your first one? Yes. Was your first one? Yeah. So it sounds like plot's definitely one of the big ones then, because it's come from you, from me, from Jen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was thinking plot is definitely what I address first, because it has to make sense. Right. And pacing, yeah, it could be, I need a car chase scene here, but it doesn't make any sense for the plot. So it's like, yeah, you have to figure out what order things come in before you can start working on when they appear. I mean, and how much you put in about them. Well, whatever questions you've raised in the course of whatever you do have to be answered. That's it. You have to tie up all the loose ends so that there is a satisfactory conclusion. And there is some other thing that also one is, must do in romance, in most genres, certainly in mystery. In mysteries, for the most part, you need to find that justice prevails because that is a satisfying conclusion. Mm -hmm. And there are some, of course, who write in a different sort of way, <laughs> and I don't read them. <laughs> Kathleen and myself, I'm going to talk about something else I've got. That reminds me of, um, I took a, a two-hour workshop locally taught by Mary Robinette Kowal, I believe is her name. She's fascinating, and she's, she's taught other workshops. She's teaching a workshop on a writing cruise that's going to be happening in September that I'm really jealous about because I can't apply or go. Um, I hope they have it again. But one of the things she talked about was um, parentheses, basically, parentheticals, and raising questions and then answering those questions in the reverse order that you raise them. So if you're familiar with coding, um, it's the same sort of thing. You open a line of code and then you close it in the reverse order as what you opened. So let's say you had a question at the very beginning of the story. Melanie's like, will I wear white or will I wear shocking red at my wedding? <laughs> and then you had a question going around the table. Jennifer is like, will I go to Hollywood and become a plot doctor? And these are all related because it's the same story. Yes, that's what we're <laughs> going with. And Fedora is like, will I write another mystery or will I write something that is completely off the wall and not historical or mysterious, but definitely has Femjep in it? And Lee's <laughs> like, will I write a children's book? instead of an erotica book right now. So then over the course of the story, you would want to answer all those questions that you had raised. Sorry, you don't get a question. You I were too far out, to yeah. the, you were literally left of me. You got left out. <laughs> um, all these, okay. So you would answer those questions. The first one that you would tackle, that you would close, that you would answer is Lee because she was the last one that you raised. So Lee is going to write an erotica book now because Kathleen likes it that way. And then you would come to Fedora next, because that was the third question you opened, the one right before Lee. Fedora is going to write a historical whodunit, and it's going to be awesome. <laughs> but she is going to have references to something completely off the wall, like uh, a pony that is wearing a cape, because Batman, Batman might love a pony. <laughs> yes. yes. I'll take that under advisement. <laughs> <laughs> so that'll be a nod to Kathleen, but people won't really know that, but that's okay. So, Can I put an Easter egg in her book? I hope the entire interaction is someone across the street going, does that pony have a cape? <laughs> <laughs> so so you've, you've then answered those two questions. Then you would tackle Jen's question next. Then finally you would tackle Melanie's, which includes you because you were marrying her. So you counted too. <laughs> so you asked these questions. You <laughs> weren't involved in the question, but you were involved in the question. Okay. You will help her answer the question, and then the story will close. Her question is whether one. or not she can solve you about whether or not she can wear that red dress she found. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so you open the questions and then you close them in that same order. You want to kind of book in things and that makes for a more complete feeling story and it also, um, I don't know, for some reason the symmetry works for people I in a, in a good way. So that, of course, the lesser plot the mm -hmm. subplot is always going to be finished before the main plot. Yes, right. and the main and plot is kind of what you want to introduce and in early. You may not want to 
And you want to leave your story with the big guns. Yes. You want to leave with the most impact you can manage. Yes. Yeah, I love I love what you just did. I hate to derail it because I'm going to go back to something which I forgot to mention that one of those colors dealt with. Mm -hmm. Symbolism. When I'm going through it, a lot, it doesn't matter if I plotted the story or if I'm canceling the story. Actually, symbolism occurs sometimes unconsciously. For example, what is symbolism? Let's say um, I use a spider web. And I not knowingly, I put a spider web in a scene that's really dark. And over someplace else, I have somebody talking about a web. It could be the internet, but a web. And in another place, I might talk about a spider. Now I'm being very conscious about putting this in. But now I'm going through and going, does a I obviously have identified a symbolism, be it consciously or subconsciously, depends on how Carl Jung you want to go there. And does that symbolism make sense? Does the symbolism change at all? Does suddenly the spider, which could be dark and scary, become a little pet? You know, that, that you, that's like a kitten. Um, I know scary, but I'm just saying, using it as an example. And if it does, okay, the symbolism can change, but does that make sense where it changed? So that's, um, that's another part of, of my editing. I wanted to uh, get into a little bit more the critique factor in fixing Please. your manuscripts because we've addressed kind of what you can do for your own manuscript. Um, but after you've done as much for your manuscript as you can, that's when I think you want to get it to other readers and get their comments. I'm just going to give you a support comment mm -hmm. and I'm going to let you keep going. In my bill pay job, mm -hmm. part of what I had to do used to be I actually had to write the documents. Now I get to just edit the documents. That sounds easy, but no, it's a lot more work. But there are documents that which I go through. If you've listened back to other Right Pack Radio episodes, I've mentioned it before. These are documents written by the federal government that you actually can make certain changes that are allowed to change. If you screw that up, I kid you not, it is about a thousand dollar fine per person who gets that book, and it's a two hundred some odd page book. So these are thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars that could be an error. You cannot, I learned the hard way, not because we got fined, but I learned the hard way through other people editing my stuff. I cannot see my errors. I cannot see the forest through the trees. You have got to have someone else's eyes to do it. Yes, um, so as you would say, like you can't see your own errors after a certain point. Um, and you get something as good as you can get it and then you send it out to other readers. Because most of the time they'll catch what you couldn't. So they'll catch part of it. Yes, they'll catch what you couldn't. So how do you guys go about getting critiques from people? How do you find good people to get critiques from? And is it cool if I give it to my mom and she says it's great? Am I am I done? No. It depends on your mom. It depends on your mom. <laughs> my my mom, mom, no writer, no my, writer. My cousin is I I consider my exception to that rule. Sarah M. Anderson, who writes for Harlequin and also another um, brand of books, um, writes romance, obviously. Her mom actually is one, is one of her top editors. I'm surprised, and I cringe in the thought she's good, so she does it well, but I just the whole thought of me giving it to my mom or to someone like that would be a huge mistake. So assuming your mother is not a writer or is not cool with erotica for some of us at this table, uh -huh. how do you find people who can critique your work and give you the kind of feedback you need to make it better? Um, I use social media. Um, I have some fans, of course this helps because I've already had published work, so I have some fans in my early work who have, they will raise their hand and say, hey, I will read it and give you feedback. And, be, and I look at those feedback different than I do, say, some of my author friends. So my author friends are going to get a little bit more technical, whereas the readers are going to let me know if there was major plot hole or if it didn't hold their interest, something like that, or if I suddenly was untrue to one of the characters that they love. They're going to let me know that. They're probably not going to let me know if I used a word too many times or, you know, some of the misspellings or punctuation, but... That's where the author ones will come in. They'll they'll be a little bit more on the technical side and say, okay, this didn't work here. You need a semicolon here, maybe, and help out with that. So different readers give you different things. Yes, different readers give you different things. Hunt for them. <laughs> I've been blessed 
Here are some of my critique partners throughout the times. I have had uh, Susan McBride, Judy Marisi, Joanna Slan, Claire Applewhite. I have had some great ones. And uh, they have, they're all published. They know what they're doing. But you don't just find them at the local Walmart. You have to join writers groups. You have to find people who are similar to you and who are able to help you with what you want to do. And you, of course, reciprocate by doing the same for them. So you have to get out, find people who write, and talk to them and get yourself a good critique partner or critique group. I'll say that for someone that's just starting out, there's a lot of trial and error and being able to recognize good critiques when you find them because, yeah, your friend might be good at critiquing or at least good at critiquing in certain ways, giving you certain things. Mm -hmm. But you have to be able to recognize if their advice is useful to you and makes your work better or not. So if someone reads it and says that it's great, the best thing they've ever read, just by chance, maybe they're right, but 9,999 times, it means they're not very good at critiquing. You need, and if they just say it's terrible, that's not very useful either. You need the right kind of advice. And um, if they give you advice, it might even be technically good critique advice, but then you have to consider, okay, are they my, do they like this type of work? Are, do they like my genre? Are they my target audience? I was in uh, two different writing classes in college. One of them, I meshed with. I got some great critiques. The second one, I actually submitted the same story with the professor's knowledge, but the results I got back made another interesting story. But it was a completely different story than the one I was trying to write. And I had to recognize that, hmm, this is a story that would appeal to mostly, you know, 30-year-old women or something like that. And this is a male that's just coming from it from a completely different point of view. And it's like, yeah, I'm not writing this story for him. <laughs> so. I tend to do, and I tend to do a little bit of what Lee talked about and what Fedora talked about. I do three layers of editing after I get done on my own. I give it a beta reader. And What's if a beta reader? A beta reader is a reader who is reading a, a, an edited draft of your work. They are not necessarily a professional. Um, I give it to them, and I look at the, I look, I try to choose good ones first, but sometimes you don't know how they're going to how they're going to read it. So I look at what they critiqued back. If I get a, oh, this is great, or this is terrible, it's like, okay, I, I love you as one of my readers, I will not give it back to you again. If they start pointing out things, like what uh, Lee was talking about, it's like, okay, I will, I keep that in a list. These are the people I want to use. And I look for people who I trust their advice. And usually, sometimes I don't discover who I can really trust until I get back results. I take what they give me under advisement, and then I give it to professional editors, or I will give it to other authors like what Fedora does. People who know, who are in this field, they know what to really look for and how to clean up that aspect. I'm still not done. Go ahead, you got a question, if you, if you want to pause me. Okay, then I have got a friend who I'm extremely blessed with having who is right now ready to kick me in the pants because I haven't given her anything to read for a while. But she's a copy editor. She goes through looking for all the grammar and the punctuation mistakes. Now she's my last line. Because what when I'm done with what she gives me, it should be polished. Should, knock on wood, be ready to go. That's my that's my three left three steps. Did you have oh, I just there? wanted to um make uh, people aware that when you're getting people to do critique for you, it's good to have as many people as you can on your lists mm -hmm. because not everyone's going to have the time or have the energy or be able to critique for you, especially if you have a deadline. So the more people you have on your roster that you can call on, the more likely it is that you'll get more comments back for your work. I want to say something about, about having amateurs or beta readers mm -hmm. do it too. If, uh, and a lot of times they will have no idea what's wrong, right. but they'll know that something is just not gelling, something is just not there, and they'll say, I don't get it, or uh, what did you really mean, that kind of stuff. And they don't know how to fix it, they don't even know what's wrong with it, but you see that that is a red light, okay, they're right, there's something wrong here, I gotta fix it. I, I don't know how to fix it, but I'm gonna read it until I do. Go back to our previous episode about Neil Gaiman's uh, rules on writing. He talks about the people like that. They know what's wrong. 
yeah, okay, there's something that you need to listen to it. They, if they tell you, hey, here's what's wrong, they're probably not right about what's wrong. They're right about something being wrong. That's paraphrasing. Oh, no, I, I thought it was they were right about there being a problem, they were wrong about how to fix it. That's what I just yeah. said. I didn't think that's what you just said. Okay, well, that's, that's what I thought yeah. I said. Well, um, at any rate, there's a, a book by Orson Scott Card called How to Write Science Fiction and Fantasy. Mm -hmm. And in that book, he talks a bit about the process that he used to turn his wife into his ideal critique partner, his ideal critiquer. Um, I don't think his wife is a writer, but she catches everything now. Um, and what he did to kind of show her what he needed was he would ask her to uh, tell him or, or write for him where she got disinterested or where she stopped believing in certain things, or, you know, where the reactions, uh, where she had reactions to his story that were or were not what he wanted. So in that way, he could take that information and figure out what the problem was and then use that to uh, come up with a solution. So something that uh, uh, critique partners and readers can do is they can tell you there is a problem here or I lost interest here or I don't believe this character would do that. They won't always have the best solution for you, but just knowing where the problem areas are, you can usually come up with the best solution. In Sorry, I, I just had a very geeky I, science fiction -y idea that actually probably would work, but it's completely impractical. Have someone listening to the audio of your draft while they're in an fMRI machine <laughs> so you can get their emotional reactions. <laughs> you read it. Actually, <laughs> actually, <laughs> yeah, a ahead. friend and I will do read alouds. Um, we are no longer in the same state now, but we'll do read alouds on Skype or on FaceTime um, video chat. So she'll read her story. And she can see my face and I'm really animated when I'm listening to something so she can see in my face where I'm losing interest or where I get really excited or when I'm when I really love something so she knows those ways like don't change this or like this way she was kind of she looked off to the side for a little bit like she wasn't paying as much attention and doing read alouds are amazing they're amazing for both people so I highly recommend them read aloud people Wonderful. Even without someone else to hear you. Mm -hmm. A read aloud is not a bad idea. You can hear where your sentences are clunky. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you want to narrate your own audiobook, it's good practice. <laughs> um, there was a story that I used in my um, application, and one of the things that I did after I had done all the other edits, then I edit for line, I edit for language, and I would read it all the way through and see where things felt clunky, see where the rhythm felt off, you know, and edit things for that because at that point, all the other changes have been made. It's more line edits are the things that you save for last, if you're me, because everything else has been done. These are the last things. You can do the surface problems now. You can, you know. Polish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, can, you can put some cream on that rash and, you know, Neosporin <laughs> on that on that little paper cut you gave yourself. Aren't you extending that metaphor a little <laughs> bit far? You can, uh, you know, cut the fingernails that have grown far too long for Fedora's liking. Wow. Yeah, cut the fingernails of the corpse. Mm. Come on. Oh, eating a dead horse. <laughs> Not Batman, though. Okay. Mm. okay. No, actually, uh, a friend of mine actually does, you tell him back to read alongs, he has the computer reco read his work, records it onto a, D onto a CD, and puts it in his car as he's driving. So wherever he's li so he's listening to his own book on disc, if you will, while he's and driving, he's catching what f problems it has as it's going. The problem I see with that is how do you take notes while you're driving? That's his problem. Voice memo, <laughs> voice memo app on my phone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we've talked a bunch about uh, fixing messy manuscripts. I admit we have not talked much about giving things to Jen so she can tell you what the problem is because Jen's really good at that, um, especially if it's a plot or a structure problem. But um, we haven't really talked much about keeping the promises that you you raise in your stories to readers. So I think you did a little bit, but go ahead, keep going. So when you're critiquing, how do you figure out what you've promise to readers? Do you even go through edits um, looking for things that you have implied are going to be answered or for things that you've implied uh, need resolution? How do you guys do things like that or do you? As a plot doctor, what would you look at first? Um, I'll confess that the question of keeping a promise to the reader is kind of a foreign concept to me. The question is about 
keeping your book a world unto itself and have all those, as the tragedian says in Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, and all who are marked for death then die. The, uh, my biggest, if you're going to ask how I doctor scripts mm -hmm. or, or stories, mostly if someone, friend of mine, has a problem, doesn't know how to fix it, then all I do is ask them questions. Usually the solution solves itself in front, just in front of you. You ask, why did this person do that? And then the writer knows better than I do. I don't know. But if I don't understand it, then that needs to be explained. And if the explanation doesn't jive with what's happening in the story, well, then there's your problem. Uh, why did my character uh, fight so hard to go out into this group of people when he felt subconscious? Oh, why did he do that? Oh, well, that's what I have to solve. You have to ask the question of your your character, ask your question of your writer, and sometimes it's hard to ask yourself a question. It's a lot easier to ask someone else, based on either a problem that someone comes you know brings up to you. We do that a lot around the table when we get together for our little write pack write-ins on Thursdays. Uh, we hang out, and someone looks up and says, "If I were an 18-year-old girl, and I was trapped in a giant mouse trap." what would I do? And then everyone said, you know, inevitably someone will raise their hand and say, is your back broken? <laughs> and if the answer is yes, then it's like, not much. But <laughs> you can, perhaps there's a way we can find out of doing that that I hadn't thought of because I was trapped in the mouse trap and I needed someone else to sort of ask the question is, you know, can you reach anything? Mm -hmm. uh, is there anyone nearby that you can call for help? How, where did the mousetrap come from? What's the point of it? Why is it even in the story to begin with? <laughs> uh, those questions, you, you just need to think about it in pieces from an outside source, and that's usually the trick I use. I've noticed from your point of view, uh, Jen, it's always important to both be internally consistent, well, in a general sense, as in your world, the physics the physics of your world stay the physics of the world. Mm -hmm. But then the second thing is the characters need to be true to themselves. And if the character does something different, there has to be a reason. Even Either the character is changing or there's some external motivation that makes them do something not characteristic of them. I'm a firm believer that uh, the story... I'm a firm believer that a story is going to sort its own problem if because it's an, a living creature. Your story and your characters are alive and they're real people and they want to exist as much as we want them to exist. Sometimes you have to let them go ahead and do their own thing. Sometimes you have to ask them why they're doing it. And sometimes you have to step back and realize that you're the one who's forcing them off course. But if a character is doing something that they wouldn't do and it still has to happen, they have to have a very compelling reason to break some part mm -hmm. of themselves mm -hmm. and it has to have repercussions through the rest of the story. Yes. Or ideally it should. Well, ideally it has it to. <laughs> Unless you're doing it wrong. In which case, you have to ask yourself, why is this thing that should have broken this character in this way not having an effect for the rest of the story? And it's a problem you have to fix. And yeah, the minute that you uh, raise a question in the reader that is not a question of one of the characters, as soon as the reader says, why did he do that? The reader is no longer in the book. The reader is now holding the book and wondering about what you, as the author, what your motivation was, and that's not being in the story. That's being thrown out of the story. Which I'd like to bring back to Batman v Superman, actually. <laughs> it all comes around. It does. Uh, you open with that, you close with that, because um, we're getting close to time. Um, in Batman v Superman, if everything internal had stayed consistent, I would have had a better experience. But the problem I had with the movie started early. It started in the first set of scenes. Something broke my belief in the world they were creating. And once that belief was gone and it was not fixed in the story, it was very hard for me to connect with the story Just and see it as an insider. Was that the floating bat scene or was it another different one? That bat scene. So, spoiler alert, Bats propel Batman into the air as a child, as if it is a tornado, but he is in the eye of it, rising up like a god. <laughs> you find out this is a dream sequence, but by that point, the, the world was broken irrevocably for me, and I could never get my belief back. See, I didn't like that because scene, but it wasn't such a big deal for me. <laughs> the way they explained it could not make me believe anymore. So that's that one thing had far-reaching repercussions for me because I could not get back into the world. So if you're going to break something for your reader, 
you need to at least explain it in such a way that they can get back into the story. Readers and watchers will forgive anything if you explain it well enough. I have an excellent uh, anecdote to uh, further explain the concept of having broken uh, your suspension of disbelief. Uh, there's a terrible movie that came out not long ago called 10,000 BC, and it's awful in nearly every way. Um, it was shown for my university for free in our auditorium because they knew it was awful, and they were hoping that some stupid college kids would give it a whole lot of good reviews so that people would see it anyway. So we went, and now I'll remind you that I was still me back then. And <laughs> my, my friends and I were all... Uh, storytellers, um, specifically my friend Elena, uh, I love her very much, uh, she's a script writer. So she was watching this film, and unlike me, when I run into a bad movie that is, I'm realizing is just getting worse as we go along, it becomes funnier. <laughs> Elena gets angry at it. She is upset that it has the gall to exist in front of her. So we're watching this film, and uh, first off, it takes place in 10,000 BC on Pangaea, but they didn't uh -huh. acknowledge that in Pangaea, the continents that form it are not maintaining the ecosystems that they have at our present time. So this caveman walks for two days and crosses a tundra, a jungle, a desert, all of these different biomes, that are within foot distance of each other. Uh, and she's like, this is stupid. And I'm like, yeah, it is. But not out of it yet. He gets trapped in a bamboo pit, like a legit bamboo pit, <laughs> by the world's ugliest CG tiger I've ever seen. And uh, then he makes peace with the tiger using some sort of soul magic. Still not, still doesn't have her out of it. He gets chased up a tree by a giant killer chicken. Still doesn't have her out of it. We get to the pyramids, which are being assembled by mammoths <laughs> that are pulling giant blocks to build the pyramids. Still not out of it, but at the very, very end, the girlfriend of our caveman that we've been following uh, is, is stricken down. And the camera zooms off into the distance and we come back to his home village where the old wise woman who told him to go on this quest looks up, sheds a tear, and dies. And her soul brings the girlfriend back to life. And Elena stood up and said, I'm done. <laughs> wow. And that was the moment. She had put up with it all that time. And that was when she was broken. And the movie had no meaning any longer. Then we went to Denny's and complained about it for three hours. You know, that was the point that David threw the, the time piece that tells us how much time we have left. He was done too. I was. It was, it was a terrible movie. Well, just as kind of a final word, I'd like to talk about obstacles, because in the course of any novel, you're going to put obstacles to romance, to solving crimes, to whatever, mm -hmm. and these have to be explained or overcome in some fashion by the time that you end, and so that you have a satisfactory ending. And I think those are probably too many obstacles too for many. anybody yeah. to, to I, take care of. When, when we got to the mammoths, I was rolling. <laughs> it was hilariously bad. Like, they were trying, they were expecting me to take that seriously, and that was the funniest thing anyone could assume of me, because it was so far out. I've had myself break in the other way, too. I'm notorious for being the only person in the room who hates Toy Story 3. I hate Toy Story 3 because they expect me to make a leap of emotional commitment that goes too far for me, and it throws me off. And when they turned on the tinkly, tinkly music in this the scene that was so ridiculous that I started laughing, and then I realized I was the only one in the theater who was laughing, and everyone else was crying, and they expected me to jump with my emotions into, it's, if we've, seen, if we've all seen Toy Story 3, it's the swirling, fiery death pit. Okay? There's a <laughs> swirling, fiery black hole of death that goes straight to hell. And they expect me to believe in this world where everything is the same except the toys are alive, that that's a real set piece in a real junkyard somewhere. This literal whirlwind, whirlpool of, of fire. And I was laughing at it because I thought for certain we were going to have some sort of a comedy rescue that was going to follow because it was so ridiculous. But instead they played it completely straight and all of our toys held hands and rode the whirlpool into death. And I crossed my arms and said, nope, no, nope, I'm not in this anymore. Thanks, though. They pulled and a Thelma and Louise in Toy Story? They <laughs> did. Now, spoiler alert, they don't die that way. Uh, they do make it out. And then they get 
we have this emotionally tingly winky goodbye of Andy giving his toys away to someone else and they expect me to shed tears over that but at that point I'd been thrown free of the Bronco and I was sitting on the sideline shaking my head nope you're not gonna make me cry about this Toy Story 3 you wasted that opportunity you're dead to me now and on that <laughs> note we're gonna end this session and end this episode but tune in next week for yet another interesting adventure in the writing industry the new theme songs for Right Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her. Right Pack Radio would like to thank STL Books for allowing us to record in their office. STL Books is a online bookstore specializing in new and used high quality literature, children's books, and books written by or about St. Louis. Please visit them online at www.stlbooks.com or find their store on the Amazon.com website.